The Great Leap Forward is the name given to the second five-year plan employed by the Chinese Communist Party. Though due to its failure, it only lasted three years. It started in 1958, and the aim was to collectivize the farming practices of the Chinese people and prepare China for modernization, but it resulted in the deaths of millions. Anywhere between 30 and 55 million people died as a result of the policies put in place. In today's video, we will look at the causes and motivations behind the actions that gained Chairman Mao infamy as the man responsible for millions of deaths. It is worth starting with a brief explanation of the situation of the Chinese Communist government during the 1950s and how they got into that position. We will not cover the Long March or the Civil War, as these topics deserve videos on their own. But following a protracted revolution and a series of civil wars, Mao established the People's Republic of China in October of 1949. His first step was unifying the Chinese people under a communist state. Mao was inspired by Marxist and Leninist thinking, but one of his key focuses was on the divide between the peasant farming classes and those who lived in the cities. Unlike Marx's theory that the peasant class were incapable of being a revolutionary force, Mao attempted to create within the millions of Chinese peasant farmers a revolutionary force capable of leaping over the steps thought required to create a communist utopia. In the 1950s, around 80% of the Chinese population were in some way working in agriculture. This, however, was not enough to modernize China in terms of creating a world-class industry. A comparison was often drawn between the Soviet Union and its start as a largely peasant population that was able to become a world superpower, though at great cost. For an example of this, please see our video on the Holodomor. It was the first video we did on the channel. A common refrain to inspire the Chinese population was the Soviet Union's today is our tomorrow. Mao's aims of the Great Leap Forward were not only to match the Soviet Union, but to surpass it. Mao also believed that the Soviet Union had deviated from the true path and goals of communism, and it was up to the Chinese people to become the next communist utopia. Mao's steps to achieve this can be seen as follows. 1. To create an industrialized economy that could compete with the Western powers. 2. To collectivize the country's agriculture. And 3. To use the peasant population to drive forward the growth of the country. In January of 1958, Mao unveiled the Great Leap Forward. The plan would to be encourage the population to take control of the production and be proud of the output. Some of the peasant population would be shifted from agriculture to industrial production. It was expected that the remaining farmers, who through using more effective methods, could more than compensate for their comrades, who were moved over to the new small-scale industrialization experiments. Peasants were expected to drastically increase steel production. The target in 1957 was 5 million tons, but this was to be doubled to 10 million for 1958. The 10,000 years of happiness that Mao had promised would first need to be at the cost of serious sacrifice of the population. The first step in revolutionizing the farming production was to collectivize the farms. This would mean state-owned farms made up of seized land, which were to be worked on by communes made up of around hundreds or even thousands of people. This land had to be taken from the landowners by the peasants in 1949, and now it was being used by the state. It was not only land that was taken by the state, but also livestock, equipment, and in some instances, even private homes. Life for those working on a collectivized farm was heavily regimented. People were not permitted to grow or store their own food. Instead, communal kitchens would provide all that was needed. As opposed to relying on modern equipment, Mao pushed for the mobilization of as many people to work on the land as possible. 
the responsibility would be handed over to the peasantry, who would be overseen and encouraged by the state. Mao believed that so much food would be produced by the people eager to take control of the production, that there would be great surplus in which to pay off any debts owed to the Soviet Union and further invest into the other industries, such as mining or heavy industry. This plan proved to be catastrophically wrong. One of Mao's metrics for success for the Great Leap Forward was steel production. The goal was to encourage the entire population to contribute to the effort. As I said before, the target in 1957 was to produce 5 million tonnes, but this was doubled to 10 million in 1958. This would be achieved by having people construct their own backyard furnaces. Rather than to train people, trial and error was the preferred method. Scrap iron from many sources, including old pots and pans, farming tools or household items was melted down to create steel. It was expected that the anticipated increase in food production would mean people would jump at the chance to also produce steel, working with one another in collectives. In general, people took to steel production with enthusiasm, however, as they received no training or direction as to how to produce steel, the quality was often very poor. This resulted in useful items such as farming tools being wasted. In many instances, this worthless steel was sent to secret dumps. No one in the party was willing to point out the practice was resulting in such waste. In addition, the demand for wood to fuel the backyard furnaces increased dramatically resulting in mass deforestation. The polluting effect was intense, as villages glowed red under the cover of thick smog. Policies designed to increase food production were a major cause for the fall in the food harvests. One of the biggest failings is what is known as close planting. This is where plants are planted close to one another, so that more crops can be grown in a given plot of land. As the plants grow, the fight for nutrients in the soil can often result in crop failures, especially if the soil is that of poor quality. There was a belief that the same type of crops growing together would only help crops to grow. Trakim Lezenkia, a Soviet biologist, pushed the belief that the plants of the same species would work together to grow and not compete, a belief that Marxist theory could be applied in the place of Mendelian genetics in understanding crops. These beliefs were accepted by the Chinese state and proved to be disastrous, as crops failed and the deficit in food production only grew worse. One of the policies that best displayed the short-sightedness of the state was known as the Smash Sparrows campaign. The goal was to kill as many sparrows as possible to stop them from eating the grain. The population was encouraged to kill as many sparrows as possible through shooting, destroying nests or harassing the birds until they died of exhaustion. As a result of this practice, insect populations exploded as the sparrows, which would usually keep them in check, were decimated. In particular, locusts devastated the crops. In the end, flocks of sparrows were imported by the Soviet Union but by that point, the damage had already been done. In July of 1958, the Yellow River, the second longest river in China, flooded. Vast numbers of farm workers were redirected to deal with the flood relief. It has been argued that the flooding was made worse due to the ill-thought-out irrigation systems built as part of the Great Leap Forward. In 1959, severe droughts ruined harvests and made conditions even harder for the struggling peasant farmers. But arguably, the biggest factor for the famine was the unequal distribution of resources. Mao gave an infamous speech, during which he warned, In the next three months, we need to put our efforts into developing our industry. We must be forceful, relentless, and precise. Our leadership in charge of industry should act like the first emperor of Qin. To distribute resources evenly will only ruin the Great Leap Forward. When there is not enough to eat, people starve to death. 
it is better to let half the people die so that the other half can eat their fill. Uneven distribution was a fundamental part of Mao's economic plan. It was not viewed as practical to evenly distribute resources such as food or steel. Mao was determined to use the surplus as expected to bring China's industry into the 20th century. As a result of the many failed policies and natural disasters, which were often exacerbated by the state's policies, food production dramatically fell. However, those in charge of the communes did not report any issues in production. Instead, they inflated what had been produced. Some leaders of the communes even inflated the production by as much as three or four times the actual amount grown. As a result, the food taken by the state was of a proportion of the falsely reported production, leaving the farmers with very little of what they actually produced. In some instances, the amount being requisitioned by the state would be more than what was actually grown. One example as to the disparity between the reality and the fiction of abundance was that in 1960, it was thought that there was 50 billion portions of grain in the state stores, when in reality, there was only 12.7 billion portions. If anyone dared to point out that the Great Leap Forward was failing, they were deemed to be rightists, working against the people's efforts. Those who were considered to be working against the Great Leap Forward faced extreme punishment. The anti-rightist campaign was in full swing during the Great Leap Forward. It was started in 1957 following the Hundred Flowers campaign. During the Hundred Flowers campaign, party members were encouraged to provide their honest opinions on the Communist Party and how the state was being run. Millions of letters were sent to the party's chief voicing concerns or making suggestions. But after a time, those who were thought to be working against the state were identified and imprisoned, thanks in part to the letters and comments made during the Hundred Flowers campaign. The result was the anti-rightist campaign, which resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of political prisoners. Because of this, many of the commune leaders inflated the production in order to avoid being seen as a rightist, creating a delusion that there was no famine despite millions starving. Life for those working on the farms became unbearable. One survivor of the famine was Li Yequin. She recalls eating dandelion leaves, corn husks and rice sprouts in order to survive. At only 16 years old, she recalls watching her father starve to death. Then one day, he was unable to get up. When he asked Li for some help getting up, he could only manage to roll around the bed. Eventually, he stopped moving and passed away. As millions starved to death, the exports from China to the Soviet Union did not stop. Grain was sent to repay various debts and to prove just how well the country was doing. In other instances, grain would rot away in the vast stores of the larger cities, or in the fields as there was not enough farmers to harvest the crops. It was not uncommon for large groups of people, sometimes hundreds, scouring the earth for any morsels of food they could find. Unconventional food sources such as grass, sawdust, leather, even seeds sifted from animal manure were all consumed in a bid to survive. Cats, rats and insects were all consumed, whether or not they were found dead or alive, until there was nothing left. Unlike other famines, death from disease was not a major factor. The people who died truly died from not eating enough and starving to death. It was said that in some parts of the countryside, you could not hear any birds sing, as they had all been consumed by the desperate. In such dire situations, it is not hard to understand that an estimated 2 million people committed suicide. The death tolls are beyond all comprehension. In the Henan province, an estimated 1 million people died as a result of the famine, which equated to one eighth of the population. As is unfortunately often the case in famines, the starving people often resort to cannibalism. 
In the Enwe province in 1960, there were 1,289 reported cases of cannibalism. These instances were reported in secret and in a very prescriptive manner. For example, one police report stated, Mawe of Maji Commune, Chinmin Village. Status, common peasant. He ate Chen Zachi, relationship, spouse. He ate his own wife. He dug her body up and cooked it. But the horrors did not end there. There were reports that some of the prison camps were selling the corpses of prisoners. Bodies would be dug up and sold and battered away. Those who engaged in such illicit activity would be able to obtain more food than those who didn't. Chairman Mao was very much aware of the successes and failures of the Soviet Union in their attempt to modernize. He was aware enough to ensure the farms were collectivized as to control production but chose not to follow the consequences as seen in the famines in Ukraine. It was not until 1960 that the state responded in any meaningful way. Workers in the industrial cities were sent back to the countryside and restrictions against planting personal crops were removed. But by this point, the vast majority of the deaths that were to take place during the famine had already occurred. The agrarian forces were decimated and starving. Mao conceded that his policies had failed to produce the desired results and instead handed over control to Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi who ended the fatal distribution policies. Mao's policies were openly criticized as wasteful and ineffective as other factions took over leadership positions and Mao took a back seat. Mao would bide his time until the Cultural Revolution in 1966 where he would consolidate power and liquidate his enemies. Liu Shaoqi was one of them. Today, the Chinese state refers to the years of 1958 to 1961 as the three years of natural disaster or the three years of difficulty. And whilst it does accept that the Great Leap Forward is not achieving its goals, it does celebrate the revolutionary spirit of those who push to modernize China. The censorship has not deterred some, including those who took part in the Folk Memory Project with the aim to record the stories of those who lived through the famine. We would strongly recommend you to read further into the Great Leap Forward and the consequences for the Chinese population. A great place to start is Tombstone by Yang Ji Sheng, a compilation of stories from those who survived the horrors. It's impossible to comprehend the deaths of so many people in such a short period of time. So many people that the brain cannot even comprehend the number. The unrealistic expectations placed on the population to achieve great feats without any support proved to be fatal. The famine was kept secret from the rest of the world until China started to open up. The inconceivable numbers of the people who starved could have likely been avoided if the state had acted and not maintained its disastrous course. I do not think it's possible to comprehend the amount of people who died as a result of such unequal distribution of food in a communist state. I hope you all take the time to look into this subject a little further as there are many explanations given and hopefully we can at least learn something from this tragedy.